online world and the real world have become so dissociated and so distinct that they don't even look like the same place anymore. You see that with media, but you also see it with the things that are so troublesome to people online that don't seem to make themselves manifest in the real world at all. So we've got this weird divorce that's a consequence of this layer of abstraction that's the online world, and it's producing its own associated pathologies. That, that rise in self-destructive behavior, that's absolutely, that's cataclysmically awful. Let me add another bit of pathology to this. Tell me what you think of this. So you know, of course, that there's been an absolute explosion in childhood gender dysphoria. And uh, it made sense to me that that occurred because we added confusion to the definition of male and female, let's say. And when you confuse people, you confuse the most confused the most. And that often tends to be young girls around 13. And they're the ones that are prone to psychogenic epidemics. And they're the ones that are experiencing much higher rates than normal of so-called gender dysphoria. Now, I'm curious about your uh, thoughts on that in relationship to attention seeking. Because if we took that group of the, the more neurotic catch-up players on social media, they need a marker of uniqueness or status in order to attract attention to themselves. And it seems to me that this emphasis on multidimensional sexual identity provides an easy avenue to the kind of uniqueness that might scale well on social media. Does that does any of that make any sense to you? Is that a reasonable hypothesis? Well, it's really hard because these trends are so new and we don't yet have, uh, you know, really solid statistics. It's actually something that I worked on for, for my new book. So I'll be able to talk about that a little bit more um, next year because like that has to be the first step is we have to say, is this actually increasing? Because it certainly seems that way, but we need that that data to figure that out. Uh, and then the, the why question is an even harder one to answer uh, because some, of course, have made the argument that, well, there's more acceptance now. And so that's why, you know, there are more more people who are who are coming out as as transgender, um, but there is the whole question, um, which I think is a good. We have to explore it at least about what is the role of um, the online communities in this, because there are some folks who have said it's it's a, a positive thing that. The thing about online communities is if you're in a relatively unique group, you can find other people like you, and that that can be beneficial. Um, but there are some who argue that that may not be as as beneficial, um, and I, I it's it's just so early. I think we just don't really know. It's probably beneficial if the group that you're pursuing is pursuing beneficial aims that are part of your character. Like if you have a particular creative proclivity or a, a particular interest in a set of ideas, and you can find a group that will support you in that, that's not much different than what happens to kids who are smart when they go off to university, if universities are working properly. But if you're anorexic and you find a community that's devoted to ensuring that you do think that you're fat and helping you figure out ways to restrict your food and normalizing that, then obviously that's not helpful at all, quite the contrary. And so, and it, and it, it, it is a peculiar fact that statistically unlikely proclivities can be normalized very rapidly online as a consequence of the generation of the community. Because as you know, we tend to um, re re regard ourselves in relationship to the peer group, the immediate peer group that we formulate around us. And so if you're one in 10,000 in your peculiarity, but you have 20 people around you who are the same, it's gonna feel pretty damn normal pretty quick. And if you're truly exceptional, that's a good thing. But a lot of what constitutes truly exceptional, exceptional is, uh, is manifested on the pathological side. And, and well, and, and we don't know the consequence of community building on that front yet. Right, well, and there's also the facilitation of online predation as a consequence of, of the irresponsibility that anonymity allows too. So if you are an isolated young person and you're searching around for an identity group, you're just quite nicely likely to run into somebody who's psychopathically predacious online as well. And that happens in no small uh, percentage of cases. I've known a number of adolescents who got tangled up with someone pretty damn nasty online, much to their parents' chagrin. And so and that's especially true on the sexual exploitation front. Well, you know, we could think about this from an evolutionary biology perspective, I think, for a moment or two that might be interesting. So I know that the, 
The rates of psychopathy appear to vary between about 1% and 5% cross-culturally. And so I talked to David Buss about various theories about that, um, that percentage. And so the first observation is, it's actually not very effective to be a power-mad psychopath, right? So 95 to 97% of people aren't. And the reason for that is it's really not a very effective strategy. You even have to run away from yourself eventually if you're a psychopath. And they tend to have itinerant lifestyles because people caught on to their narcissistic Machiavellianism sooner or later and then can identify them. Now, it might be more useful, biologically speaking, to be a predatory psychopath than to be someone who's so depressed and isolated that they never go out of the house. So you could think about it as a a strategy of, a reproductive strategy that doesn't always culminate in failure. And that's especially true because young women are less likely to be able to distinguish psychopathic predators from confident and competent males. So, okay, so you, you open up a window for psychopathy and then the window's opened up too because most people are cooperative and productive and generous, at least in the main. But what that means is that a small percentage of people can capitalize on that by mimicking it. And the psychopaths mimic that by being confident and assertive and appearing competent, even though they're predators and, and, and parasitic in their fundamental orientation. Now, those people, that one to 5%, present an unbelievable constant danger to the integrity of societies, right? If it doesn't take that many people to destabilize a complex society, and certainly 3% is more than enough. And normally, the psychopaths are kept under some regulatory control because they get identified and isolated and, and punished. But I don't think that happens online. And so, it's, I don't know to what degree the, the, look, psychopaths don't learn from punishment very well at all, and they don't learn from threat very well at all. But online, all of that's been removed. There's nothing but a field of opportunity for predatory psychopaths. And so I wonder to what degree virtualizing communication and opening up this hypothetically democratic front has actually magnified the degree to which our societies are susceptible to disruption by Machiavellian psychopaths. That is absolutely possible because, yeah, I mean, there's there's the trolls and all of those folks who, um, you know, get into those situations, they too often absolutely get away with that. Um, you know, I think some people might argue that, well, they might get lots of negative comments and, you know, sometimes they do get punished or, or canceled, but it's not usually the way it goes because, yeah, they have a lot of tricks. Um, they, can, they can be charming and they can fake their way through it. And they do often get away with a lot, just partially because things are so unregulated. It's the wild, wild west. Well, they can also generate multiple identities. So even if one of their identities gets published, punished, well, first of all, they're not likely to be very affected by negative feedback to begin with, especially not of the psychological sort, because the typical psychopath doesn't give a damn what you think. Like they might, they might react with some degree of surprise if you actually hit them. But if you just said something that might disturb a person with, with normal uh, conscience, let's say, the psychopath is going to brush that off. And so... True. 